All right, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the April meeting of Fire Safe San Mateo County. Um, we have a couple presentations this morning for you and um, some, some good updates. But first, uh, our first presenter is Paul Hesberg. Uh, he's a senior research ecologist uh, with the USDA Forest Service. And he's stationed at the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Um, Paul holds a PhD from Oregon State University, and he's a courtesy professor for the University of Washington, the School of Environment and Forest Science, and also Oregon State, uh, the College of Forestry. Uh, Paul's research explores wildfire and climate change effects on the forest dynamics and resilient landscape conditions, and their resolve as the climate shifts and the ecology of the forest reburning. So, I personally am ecstatic to have Paul speak um, and very intrigued with his research um, and so happy that he could take the time uh, to present this morning to FireSafe. So Paul, um, I'd like you to take it over and, and explain to us what's happening at our forest. What's happening? Well, thanks for the introduction, Denise, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm excited about this opportunity. Uh, over the, just a little bit about um, moi, over the last four decades, I've been studying changes in Western landscapes from the early 20th to the early 21st century, and then translating how those changes have influenced major disturbance processes like uh, insect outbreaks, bark beetles, defoliators, and changes in forest pathogens and their dynamics. And, uh, and then I shifted into looking at uh, how wildfire regimes have been influenced, how do attributes of forests and woodlands drive changes in fire behavior. So I'm going to tell you a little story about that today, and I look forward to the Q&A. Before I begin, what I want to do is show you what I think are some pretty dramatic uh, photos of change in the West. And these are uh, Osborne panoramas in black and white on the top, and they represent photos from the 1930s. And then the early 21st century is typically in color on the bottom. And what I really want you to see in the panorama is the extent of change and sort of the nature of change. These are dry pine forest uh, further up with Douglas fir. And you can see how in the top photo, a, a landscape dominated by grass has now become a landscape dominated by forest. This has occurred in a hundred years. Also see this in our oak woodlands as well. Uh, these kinds of transitions from grass domination to forest. A little further up the gradient, these are dry mixed conifer forest with uh, moist mixed conifer in the valley bottoms and some of the north aspects. And here you can see how there used to be a strong topographic influence on the distribution of forest type, canopy cover, density, that sort of thing. And you can see how those south slopes, which are staring out at us in this view, have become filled in with trees. And one of the things you can see is that bark beetles and defoliators in this particular scene, if you can see my cursor, these are uh, defoliation of the Western spruce budworm in the Douglas fir that filled in. Douglas fir was not common to these slopes historically. Further up the hill, you can see how moist mixed conifer forests, dry mixed conifer on some of the drier aspects. Uh, you can see how a patchwork, a variable for successional patchwork that varied in canopy cover, density, size class has become this uniform uh, landscape. And now you can see that mountain pine beetle and Douglas fir beetle are the uh, major disturbance filling in in the absence of fire in only a century. Still further up the hill, you can see that in the cold forests, um, fires were frequent in the cold forests. Some place was burning all the time. You can see how a, a patchwork of burned and recovering vegetation, this is a 120 degree panorama, so it actually bends the look down this uh, slate peak uh, scene. You can see how those areas have filled in with trees and we've got this sort of continuous forest in the upper reaches. 
And uh, below low, uh, upper tree line, you can still see the same thing. You can see these copses or tree islands of subalpine species with uh, wet and dry meadows uh, actually dominating in the spaces in between. And you can see how that forest gave way uh, to an area replete with high meadows to an area that's now got a hundred to a thousand times more trees in it. Here's a close up of some of those changes. It's really dram dramatic. You can see evidence of wet meadows drying up more wet meadows drying up, and then tree encroachment. And if you look at the, the ghost dead snag sticking up, these are mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle that are taking out uh, conifers that are now just overgrown given the current moisture conditions. What changed? Well, when we read through the literature between 1850 and about now, there've been a number of really significant change agents and I'm going to highlight just a few of them. In conifer forest, we had timber harvest that influenced primarily the large and the old fire tolerant trees. We had fire exclusion, which was first significant with the loss of indigenous burning. We now know that in many territories that uh, the indigenous cultures had a uh, tradition of cultural stewardship with fire maintaining the landscape and the primary effect of this was often sort of clip, clipping the right tail of the really large fire sizes and the most severe fires by the intentional addition of fire in a really sophisticated manner, as it turns out. Domestic livestock crazing comes in in the 1800s. And when we have the indigenous tribes marshaled onto Indian reservations in that 1850 to 1870 period, sort of depending on where you are, coupled with livestock grazing, cattle and sheep, and then the rapid development of the built environment, uh, we see an awful lot of changes already happening in the 1800s. And you, you layer up in the early 20th century, um, we have a, a host of influences working. Now you layer on climate change in the 20th century, uh, which we note to be quite significant in the latter part. The climate is warmer, it's drier, it's often windier, and these conditions are escalating. Here's an example of some of the influences of climate. Here I'm just depicting uh, the difference between low and high fire years for Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. You can see here that when we have moisture, there's a limited water balance deficit. And by that I mean the actual evapotranspiration doesn't exceed the potential of the vegetation cover. You don't see much fire, fuels don't cure out, ignitions don't go where suppression actions are amazing. In the high fire years, uh, actually evapotranspiration exceeds the potential of the vegetation cover. So fuels cure, live vegetation cures up. We typically see significant water deficit and uh, big fires developing in those years. This comes from uh, a Littell paper from 2009. In addition to fire suppression, we also now see the signal of uh, the climate in the period of fire suppression. In the early part of the time, we see this is burned in hectares right here. And this is the, the period of interest. You can see in the early 20th century, up until about 1935, and if you recall, that's when the 10 a.m. rule, 34 and 35, it was adopted and became successful. And now you can see the decline in acres. And then we have this quiescent period of about uh, five decades, half a century, where suppression is amazingly functional, really effective, and it was aided by a, a cooler, moister, more Pacific kind of climate. And burned area declines and it stays down. But all the while, trees are accumulating, fuel ladders are accumulating, and dead wood accumulating. Then you can see in about 1980, new studies in Western North America confirm that we see this air burn and increase, and the increases to the modern era go off the screen here. And all the while, we're actually throwing the book at fire suppression. We have more preparedness assets, more crews on the ground, more tankers, but area burn continues to climb because we're now in a warmer and a drier climate after 85. <laughs> 
And here's some of the effects of this uh, confluence of factors on forests and fire regimes, which is my topic here in this next section. The dry forests and the dry woodlands, oak woodlands of all sorts uh, in, in my country and in yours, uh, used to have a pretty frequent fire um, of low severity, and that recruited uh, lower densities of trees, generally of the larger size classes. And this was common in the lower elevations and where there was a lot of intentional burning by indigenous folks uh, in the pine forests and in the woodlands, oak woodlands, which are uh, prized, for example, the black oak woodlands and tan oak uh, were really important for collection of acorns and pest management on those acorns. And so you see frequent fires tend to reinforce low severity fire. And so whether, whether they're hardwood or conifer woodlands, open spacing, clumpy and gappy distributions, and a lot of grassland interspersed. These are areas that are capable of forest, but because of recurrent fire, they're maintained in grasslands. And essentially they become the conveyor belt for non-extreme fires. The change from the historical to the modern era is reflected here. You can see low, moderate, and high severity fire. The likelihood of low severity fire was most likely under this frequent fire regime. Keep fire out of the system by the factors I just spoke of, and you see the likelihood of moderate to high severity fire is most likely. Further up the hill, in the more moist forest conditions, fires are less frequent, let's say every 20 to 50 years, but they still reinforced a pattern of low and moderate severity fire. And these fires are take some, leave some fires. Surface fires, crown fires are both in the mix. These uh, active and passive torching influences are taking out these smaller patches like you see. Surface fires are thinning out the dead wood and burning up fuel ladders, resulting in landscapes that have this kind of uh, patchwork. Um, and occasionally when the climate was more severe, you'd have high severity fires uh, in these types. And when the, the uh, fire weather and climate influences were more moderate, you had this more typical low severity influence like the lower elevations. Also when these forest types interdigitated with dry forest, we also see uh, that low severity regime becomes more common. And, and these are the changes to the modern day. Most likely now is high severity fire followed by moderate severity fire. So here I want to uh, stop and focus on a feedback, a stabilizing feedback that is really important. Fire exclusion eliminated a local feedback at the patch to patch neighborhood scale. Locally, what happened is these more frequent fires were continually thinning forest patches, reducing density and fuels. And this feedback uh, increased the likelihood that that kind of fire would come back recurrently. So it's a stabilizing or what we call a negative feedback against severe fire. A colleague of mine has uh, made some fabulous drawings, which I'll show you here, just to sort of show how this works through time. Um, credit to Bob Van Pelt for these uh, drawings. So here we are at time zero. We've got this open, uh, not fully occupied uh, forest condition here where it could be fully occupied. In the next 20 years, we see an ignition, the fire moves through burning up dead wood. There it's torching out a fuel ladder, consuming more dead wood, burning up snags, that sort of thing. And the resulting condition is we have some snag and downwood elimination, some fuel ladders eliminated, but the condition pretty much looks like the prior condition, medium and large trees abound and they're fire tolerant. The next 20 years or so, we see another fire and now this this fuel ladder uh, torches out again. We see more uh, seedling and sapling consumption by surface fires, uh, fires uh, scorching trees, leaving scars that, that are witness to the occurrence of the fire. And again, within the next couple of decades, you see that that same condition continues to abound on that landscape. And, what happens when you take fire out of the system for 80 to 100 years or more is you see that regeneration and release that was being constantly thinned is being removed by fire. And so you have this really congested, contagious condition where fuel ladders are pretty much everywhere. And it's easy for fire conditions to, to uh, move through these fuels, develop long flame lengths, 
and then transition into crown fires. Add wind to that and we have running crown fires. Finally, we have the, the uh, high severity regime, which was normal in the upper elevation forest where there's more snowpack, more snow water equivalent. Fires were infrequent every 75 to 200 plus years. And in some areas of the Northwest, they're much longer than 200 years. And these are common in the coldest forests and some of the wetter forests. Mild climate and weather conditions actually favored milder fires. So we didn't just get standard placement patches. We actually got some variety successionally out of these low and moderate severity fires. And then when we had typical uh, more severe drying conditions, we had these high severity fires. And this is the transition in the current condition. Very little variety from uh, milder conditions because fuels um, are abundant and uh, most of that patchwork is grown back in again. Here I wanna highlight another regional scale feedback that was critically important to reducing the likelihood of really big running crown fires. These patchworks that were created of grassland, shrubland, and then varied successional condition, young, middle age, older forest, open versus closed canopy conditions and hardwood patches or mixed wood patches. These patterns spatially regulated the flow of fire. They regulated fire size, and they regulated fire severity. So two potent stabilizing factors were associated with the landscape ecology of forests and of their wildfires. And here's some visuals to show you what was going on at that time. Here's a, a species composition view of a landscape. This is about 25,000 hectare landscape. Ponderosa pine is in this light green color. And these are grasslands that um, are abundant. These are shrublands. And you can see we have some Grand Fir and Douglas Fir patches in the higher reaches and down in the valley bottoms. But we have incredible variety in patch sizes and um, forest composition. And after a century, Ponderosa Pine gives way to Douglas Fir. And here's what that looks like. So you can see these open pine conditions, these more complex forests and uh, areas of grassland and shrubland give way to, in 100 years, to a landscape that's dominated by Douglas fir and Grand fir and conditions that look like that. So real similar to that schematic drawing I showed you by Van Pelt earlier. Here's just a structural view of that landscape. These are young multi-story forests. The, in pink here, we have the stand initiation forests. Uh, Non-forests are in this gray, and so you can see, and these are old park-like stands, and these are old uh, multi-story old forests uh, in a frequently fired landscape. And what I want to show here from the structural view is that an all-age complex structural landscape is replaced by multi-story forest. So again, we see structurally these kind of conditions exist, but through increased canopy cover, area and can landscape that looks like this. And structurally, it has this condition. Here's an example of a pine uh, forested area that had never been logged, uh, only fire excluded. And what I wanna show you here is this is the kind of stocking density that you'd see just in this view. These three trees were present 150 years ago. Uh, nothing else was present in this stand. And everything that you see uh, has grown in in the interval uh, between fires. And we see this in our, our oak woodlands, and we see it in our dry pine forests as well, and further on up the hill. Here, I want to simply show you how uh, changes in structure uh, quantitatively account for changes in fuel loading, crown fire potential, and flame length. Hot colors mean long flames, high crown fire potential, high fuel loading. Cool colors indicate lower versions. And you don't even need to know what the structural names are. Just simply look and notice that there, was, there were vulnerable conditions, but they were spatially isolated on that landscape. So it was difficult for crown fires to obtain and spread from patch to patch. But you'd still see crown fires constrained by the structure of the forest. And here you can see, keeping fire out of the system, how change in the structural condition now accounts for change in fuel loading, 
the likelihood of crown fire initiation and spread and flame length. These conditions not only occur in individual watersheds, but in adjacent watersheds. So when fires get up and go, they can go for a very long distance because these changes are widespread and they're well connected. This had an influence on insects, uh, of a great variety. Of them. I'm just going to use one example here. This is the mountain pine beetle, but it applies to beetles in Ponderosa and Jeffrey pine, beetles in Douglas fir, Engelmann spruce, and uh, true firs. So we see the hallmarks, the signs and symptoms of a beetle. Uh, obviously, they're not that big, but they look pretty amazing when you crank them up on an electron micrograph, don't they? Here's a mass attack on a pine. These are the kind of galleries we see under the bark. This is the kind of modern day uh, mortality that we see. This is a native insect in now a non-native role, very large distribution in Western North America. And here's what's really changed. This is our landscape again. And here you can see how vulnerable, vulnerable areas existed in the early 20th century, but now they're next to other vulnerable areas. So outbreaks can grow and become very large like you see in that photo, because essentially the patchwork is filled in with more of these host types and they're better connected, what we call a contagious landscape. There are many other examples of this, but for brevity, I just chose to illustrate with one. Non-forest, we've also learned, this is a new area of research in our laboratory. We were wondering why we saw so much non-forest on the historical landscape, what might be its role. And what we've discovered through simulation modeling is that non-forests are part of a resilient forest landscape. They're part of the forest resilience recipe. This is a look just for fun on our west side in our coast range in Hemlock and Douglas fir, um, moist, high rainfall environments. And this is a look looking north. So you're actually seeing south slopes staring back at you that are open non-forest areas. So the, these were even significant in the fire ecology of the Oregon coast range, uh, in case you thought this was only peculiar to interior forest. This is a very, very common thing. In some provinces were 40 to 50% non-forest. And I'll tell you why here in a second. So non-forest conditions, that's just sort of a summary word for bare ground after fires that have recently burned. They're wet and dry meadows, shrublands, savannas, uh, new stand initiation forest, but mostly grass and shrubs in the, on the, uh, in the understory because there's not much tree cover. Uh, and so these are driven by grass and shrub fuel beds, primarily when fires occur. And you get mixes of these. These states, they will persist for tens to hundreds of years because they're often maintained by recurrent fire. They persist for a short time if the patches are generally small and seed rain can occur from the perimeters close by. And they tend to persist for a long time if the patches are much larger and it's really a long distance for seed dispersal. But a key factor is that um, when fires were not put out in the um, pre-Euro-American era, reburning frequency was very high. And by that, I mean fire on fire disturbances where a second fire burns part of an area, eliminates the dead wood from the previous fire, and then a forest obtains after the reburn. Why are these conditions vital to forests? We find we've now reconstructed seven large provinces. And what we found is that non-forests are nearly as abundant as forest. Uh, very often, and, and in some provinces like the Upper Klamath country, forests are actually less abundant than the non-forest conditions. What we find through simulation is there's an interplay between ignition frequency, fire weather, forest area with high canopy cover. There's a tug of war, if you will, to say it simply between factors that are growing forests and factors that are removing them with disturbance. And what that basically means is provinces vary in how much potential energy they can store as tree cover because tree cover is, is, uh, provides a lot of fuel and uh, there's a tremendous energy release from that. And so non-forest becomes this non-benign uh, fire delivery system that is the result of this tug of war between forests growing and disturbances removing them. 
And the amount of non-forest is in flux with changes in the climate and in the fire weather. This gives us key insights about what can happen with climate change. The warmer and the drier the conditions, we can expect less forested area and lower canopy cover than even in the historical condition. And regardless, a key idea resulting from this is that forests are uh, seldom at carrying capacity. So forest capable sites are very often in non-forest in this push pull, in this tug of war. All right, um, I'm gonna highlight some principles that we wrote about uh, colleagues from uh, your part of the world and mine all throughout the West. We wrote a paper sort of summarizing the literature of uh, what kinds of things conferred resilience and how we can use those to, to uh, retail or resilient conditions back to the landscape. The first principle that we cover is this idea that regional landscapes are multi-scale. Tree, clump, and gap patterns within patches uh, live inside or nest inside of forest successional patchworks of early, middle age, late, old, recently regenerated. And these live inside of broad life form patchworks of grassland, shrubland, sparse woodland, and savanna, and so forth, rock, water, and ice. And this nested, these nested conditions were really important to conferring resilience. So disturbances interacted at every single scale, and the crosstalk between these levels of organization was important to maintaining resilient conditions. So if we want to recreate resilient conditions, recalibrating forest, non-forest conditions, forest successional patterns, and tree clump and gap patterns within patches are all important to building that resilience. We find that topography provides a natural template for adapting uh, vegetation and habitat conditions. And topography plays different roles geographically from place to place. So you need to learn how topography provides influence where you are. Here's a, a visualization of valley bottom, ridge top, north and south aspect topographies. And we see in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, for example, and also in Northern California, that uh, these topographic conditions are useful to determining how forest structure and composition was arrayed. We can use them to retailer more characteristic conditions back to the landscape. We find that fire, forest successional patchworks, and climate are the engine that drives this ecosystem. Whether you're in a forest or you're in a woodland or you're in chaparral or grassland. And so recreating these multi-scale supportive life form and forest or woodland successional patterns is a key to rebuilding the fire regime, essentially driving it backwards in this way to this more varied uh, patch size distribution, and then that will allow climate to adapt these pit, these uh, patterns. As, they, as it moderates, we'll see more forest, more canopy cover. As it's less moderate or intemperate, we'll see that uh, more open canopy conditions will obtain and so forth. We found that predictable patch size distributions of various conditions are really important, and oddly, um, we published in a book chapter um, in this book right here, Landscape Ecology of Fire, that uh, patch size distributions actually are in sync with these patch sizes of topographic patches. And so here's a look at what happened under uh, fire suppression, how we decoupled patch size distributions. This is what they looked like by uh, uh, logarithmic bin size, so 10 to the 1, 10 hectares, 100 hectares, 1,000, 10,000, so forth. This is what the patch size distribution looked like. Very rarely did we see these really big ones. Take fire out of the system, these become much rarer. And now these larger patches, the grain of the landscape is being influenced by these bigger disturbances. And that tends to drive future disturbance regimes. So restoring these more typical patch size distributions is a big idea and one we need to work with. Widely distributed large and old trees, they provide a critical backbone to landscapes. They're climate and wildfire adapted and they're a genetic legacy, a biological legacy, if, if you uh, will. 
And then harvesting went after most of the big fire tolerant trees here you can see in this pine forest, but we did it in large uh, Jeffrey pine, all sorts of landscapes that were on public lands. And so uh, the recommendation here is uh, to keep what you have and make more of them, uh, especially in the fire tolerant species. And with fire exclusion, uh, duff and litter accumulations and fuel ladders near them are significant. And so they're actually threatened um, with fire, even though they may be available on the landscape. So helping them persist is a big idea and um, making more of them uh, under climate change is also really an important ideal. Successional patches. Remember I showed you multi-level landscapes. Here I want to show you just by repeat that successional patches are small landscapes within a larger landscape. It's these clumpy and gapped distributions of trees that influences patch level fire behavior and habitats and patch neighborhood fire behavior. So in the pine forest, interior dug for dry and moist mixed conifer patches, we find them all over the place. And this is also being found throughout the American Southwest and the Pacific Southwest and these types. So restoring those clumpy gappy distributions is critical to maintaining at that smallest scale, the kind of fire behavior we're interested in. Finally, land tenures, land ownership patterns really disrupt ecological boundaries. And for restoring more resilient conditions, it's actually important to work cross boundary to develop uh, adaptation projects. And uh, the Good Neighbor Authority, now that the Forest Service is working with, which is much enlarged, is gonna be a key to working across fed, state and private ownerships to get good work done. All righty. I wanted to uh, discuss uh, some key takeaways here that I can just sort of melt out of the, the concepts that I've shared. Adaptations are needed to recreate more characteristic life form patterns. This is really a key. And further north, we're using water equivalent and water deficit products to form transition the current form patterns to new one. Here's an example how we do that. This is the current snowpack under the current climate that we're seeing in an example watershed. This is probably about 40,000 acres. And so you can see with the darker colors that are a lot more millimeters of, of uh, total snowpack occurring on this landscape. And these are the predictions using downscaled climate data for snow water equivalent for the same period, but uh, from uh, 30 years from now. These are climatic water deficit calculations. We're essentially differencing potential evapotranspiration. What can the vegetation uh, allow and what's this, the capability of the current land cover? And then what's the actual that will likely occur under that future climate? And that difference shows up as deficit. So as you go here from um, red to orange to light, to blue, what you see is uh, very high. Um, so these are woodlands, shrub step, dry forest, dry and moist forest, and then uh, moist and cold forest conditions. And look at the transitions that are expected for um, 30 years from now. So, so this need to transition some environments to non-forest and not allow wildfires to do it is a, is a key idea. Second is it's important to create diverse patterns of forest successional conditions, open and closed canopies tailored to the topography. We also need to rebuild hardwood forest patches where they're appropriate to the hydrology and the uh, subsurface flow of water and so forth. We can do that after fires, after harvests, and we now know that these are influential to fire behavior, not only in our coast range and Western Cascades, but uh, also in the interior. They're sort of like wet blankets in mixed wood and in pure composition under most fire weather conditions. And so they block the flow of fire. Historical landscape complexity, we're learning is a product of reburning, not just burning. That's the fire on fire interactions when they're allowed to happen unabated Reburning decouples surface fuels from canopy fuels over substantial areas. And so treatments that mimic the amount of reburned area and the patterns that result are key. 
They're time-tested methods for creating resilient landscape, and they involve forest thinning and prescribed burning where appropriate, sometimes pile burning. Sometimes prescribed burning only uh, can be used to maintain those treatments and when fuel conditions and fire weather conditions are appropriate. In backcountry, we're using uh, increasingly managed wildfires. In some areas where the intrusions of the built environment are widespread, this is typically not an option. And areas of hardwood forests uh, where adapted to conditions, we can uh, work at a sufficient pace and scale. And by this, I mean wildfires, depending on the geographic area, are eliminating forests uh, or influencing forest conditions at three to 10 times the pace of current treatment conditions. And so wildfires are carrying the water on this landscape, not the kinds of treatments we're capable of. It's key to not do a one size fits all, it, uh, apply the appropriate tool for the conditions. And what we learned from our understanding of working with various tribes is managing commitment that has social, financial, and management ramifications. And so, so handing off conditions that are in good shape is a key result. All right, I think that uh, that ends my comments here. We have time for questions. Oh, oh, most definitely, Paul. Most, most definitely, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot. Um, I, I wrote down quite a few myself, so let me get right to it. Um, okay, so Casey has a question, and um, looking at your panoramas towards the beginning of the. Um, presentation, he wanted to know, um, does archaeology tell us about the vegetation of pre-Spanish landscapes? There's some really good papers. Um, uh, not only archaeology, so from the American Southwest, there's some great research out of Tom Swetnam's lab. Um, Al Taylor and Carl Skinner have done some great work in the Sierra Nevada. I, I alert you to a, a Taylor paper from 2016 and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where they essentially show how um, indigenous burning in the Sierras was highly influential to changing the fire regime, basically moderating it. And it moderated it so much that, that it buffered uh, the uh, area burned. So typically we now understand that climate drives area burned. And what, what Taylor saw was that um, by joining together archeological data and uh, fire scar data from trees that were alive over hundreds of years that, um, that tribal involvement and their cultural burning practices actually changed the fire ecology in ways that were beneficial to living in those forest conditions. So the influenced area burned, and they're also seeing these kinds of conditions develop in the American Southwest. And uh, more and more studies pairing dendro uh, and fire history studies with archaeology are now emerging since we're seeing these patterns. OK, uh, Lena has a question. Um, in areas that have, decade, have had decades to build up fuel, uh, is controlled burning still a beneficial practice? And, She's probably talking about, um, Lena, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, um, she's probably talking about San Mateo County. Sure, yeah, that, that's my main focus, but I was just kind of curious because I've heard different thoughts on it. So your question is fuels in the built environment primarily? Um, the question has been basically, I know that when fires go through areas that have had a lot of buildup, it can be, it can burn at higher temperatures and cause more damage. And so my, my question is, when is that no longer beneficial to do controlled burning or is there ever a cutoff and it's always beneficial? Yeah, and there's a, so uh, capable uh, uh, burn bosses and fire managers know the conditions under which they can meet prescription with the prescribed burn. Very often um, fuels are excessive, especially when large fuel sizes are available to burn. And so pre-treatment with thinning uh, out the fuels, um, burning small piles, that kind of thing is required as a pre-treatment 
And, uh, and sometimes the shoulder season environments for doing prescribed burning actually will limit you uh, for several years. And so you've got to sort of match the needed fuel reduction to the circumstances you have and to the fire weather that you anticipate. Wow. Prescribed, prescribed burn only works when you meet prescription and that's driven by the amount of fuel, uh, fuel availability to burn and then the weather under which that fuel will burn. So uh, fire managers are trying to juggle those things and that's how they think about matching the tools to the condition. Does that help? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Yep. Okay, uh, I have a question. So towards the end of your presentation, um, you were explaining how the forest um, is heating up and the cool, moist areas are being transformed into dry, warm uh, forests. And so my question is, so th during that transition, it seems to me that the amount of fuel from the the, the cool, moist forest, those species won't be able to survive. And so you'd have this huge um, buildup of material during the transition. And is that what we're expecting? I mean, are we expecting, you know, by the year 2030 or, um, or 30 years from now to have this mass amount of fuel, even more than we have now? Yeah, so, so stop and think about uh, some of the ponderosa pine and Jeffrey pine mortality events that you've had where hundreds of millions of trees have been synchronously killed by bark beetles. The, the number of trees and the species have become off-site as a result of warming and drying conditions. And so absolutely the fuels for, during fire exclusion have accumulated, but as the forest type changes because the environment is getting harsher, you can expect to see uh, an increasing mismatch. So it's one of the reasons why we caution that it's really important to get to a significant pace and scale right now because these transitions, exactly like you described, are happening. Forests, uh, moist forests, more of them are becoming drier forests. Moist forests produced more trees, more fuel, that kind of thing. And that mismatch between the dry forest conditions and the fuels associated with the moist forest is kind of a double whammy. And so actually intentionally transitioning forest is the idea to pursue rather than allowing wildfires to transition them. So don't procrastinate, act now is what you're saying. <laughs> Go big. <laughs> Go big, okay. Uh, okay, so Paul has a question regarding habitat impacts. So as these shifts occur, uh, are you working on any mitigation strategies to increase species resilience? Absolutely, and we got quite a few on the fence, don't we? Um, so one of the things that we're noticing as we look at, and that's why the snow water equivalent and um, water deficit calculation we're finding is important. We're seeing that aspects Topographic settings still drive many conditions, even under this warming condition. And that means that areas of complex forest that are late successional or old uh, still are gonna have a way to make a living on this forest. So what we need to do is identify those topograph topoedaphic settings where the soil moisture is gonna be right, the climate's gonna be right to support uh, higher stocking of trees and more complex conditions. And then, and those drier situations surrounding them open up those canopy conditions and reduce the surface fuels. So essentially you have many ways to put uh, flames on the ground as they approach uh, these more complex forest conditions. What you wanna be able to do is allow initial attack to have some influence on uh, influencing fire behavior. And that's all about managing flame length on the landscape, right? If certain flame lengths uh, will go direct, when the flames are longer, we go indirect, and it's unlikely that we're gonna produce the conditions we want when we go indirect over large areas. And so proactively creating those topographic conditions where you have complex layered forests for late successional species, for example, Martin and, and California Spotted Owl and blah, blah, blah. And then on the drier aspects, create those open canopy conditions with the larger trees. So you're managing surface fuels, flame length uh, in the surrounding area. And that's the way we're doing it in 
uh, forests in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon to protect those habitats of species already on the ropes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, uh, let's see here. Jennifer has a question. Um, so, and it's, it's specific to San Mateo County. So, um, uh, the oak woodland uh, on very, very steep slope. Um, and as you, as you probably know, we're impacted severely by SOD here. Um, so that's, we also have bark beetle, but our, our oak woodland is really being devastated by SOD. So her question is, what comment do you have about oak woodland on really steep slopes, where then you have homes at the top of these canyons? Um, you know, we, we are the definition of the wooey here. So um, I guess, what is your comment on that sort of treatment and, um, and fire behavior? There's, uh, there's so many pieces to that question. I'll try to peel them off a bit at a time. So if you stop and think about it, remember I showed you the, the era of fire suppression and how the climate varied. We basically created the built environment under a different climate and we didn't expect that we were building houses in high fire danger environments. Most of our historical fire ecology work has uh, developed in the last 30 to 40 years. And so uh, we've allowed these conditions that were burned constantly because they can become so hazardous so quickly. And uh, we're the first generations to not be burning these oak woodlands. When I was a young man, I uh, harvested trees in the Coast Range of Oregon, and I was thinning second growth forest, uh, paying my way through forestry school and graduate school. And I marveled in the Gary Oak woodlands at how many miles I could go into the Doug Fir subregion. And the first Doug Fir that had been there in 10,000 years, I was thinning 12 miles into the Doug Fir zone. That means that the oak woodland area maintained by Aboriginal burning was. 12 miles beyond the current valley floor where Gary Oak uh, woodlands obtained. So burning created incredibly well-maintained conditions. These oak woodlands need to be thinned out. They just do. And then they need to be uh, either prescribed burned or grazed to be able to maintain essentially how much fuel accumulates on those landscapes. We have this mismatch between the built environment and high fire danger environments. And we have to, to uh, reestablish some harmony between the fires that are inevitable and the fuel conditions. That's all there is to it. We also have to get a handle on expanding the wooey in these high fire danger environments. County after county are still building uh, at a rapid pace. 70% of all the new housing starts in the Western United States are happening in high fire danger environments. That's a big deal. So uh, municipalities have a responsibility to say, is this a good idea for us to continue going up these canyons with no separate So there's a lot of pieces associated with that. We're building, we're building a situation that we cannot address because of the pace of development in these environments. So we've got to manage it on several fronts, if you will. Yeah, that, that's a huge question here in San Mateo County because we, we keep growing at a very rapid pace and um, we're not going up in the urban areas, we're sprawling into the wooey. So we're creating our problem worse uh, as our forests become more and more unhealthy. The other thing that is, is very um, disturbing to all of us is that, you know, you have a home in the wooey, so the home is in the forest, you have whole neighborhoods in the forest, and then they build the home, and then they literally plant another forest on the property, so you have a forest inside of a forest. I mean, it's, it's, it's really kind of surreal and mind-boggling about the, the situation we're creating for ourselves, but I, I guess that's where you come in to, to wave the red flag. And tell us, well, whoa, 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 slow down, folks. <laughs> well, it's it's for all of us. I live in a high fire danger environment, and um, I'm so I'm in the Cascade foothills in eastern Washington, where the Cascades dive down to the Columbia River. It's just it's a slice of heaven. But we we've had fires every few years there that have burned in, burned out developments in my community, and um, fires have come within two blocks of my home where house to house fire spread was burning out neighborhoods. And 
um, it, it's not it's not for state fire people or fed fire people to do it. We literally have to involve all of us to make our homes and yards safe, get our neighborhood on the ball so it's ready to go, work with our county governments and our city governments on having a big idea about how to get fire safe and stay fire safe. It actually is gonna, it's gonna take the whole village, frankly, or we're gonna be unsuccessful. So I've, I've over the last five years have modified 50 years of vegetation development on my place so that a fire won't burn me out or won't burn my neighbor out. And I think that's the kind of work we have to do. And then I'm working with county and city managers to say um, the development you're doing, we can't protect those people. We won't send fire crews up that road and we're building more and more development. So we're starting to shut down those single road up Canyon developments because because uh, nobody's going to go to protect your home up in that area we're killing we're killing firefighters uh, to do that well and we're losing a lot of residents and we're losing a lot of structures too billions of dollars of, uh, yeah so okay Mel has a question it sounds like he uh, he's got the concept of your presentation um, he says sounds like we need to thin saplings and young trees and do pres prescribed burns to clear space and encourage more open areas of meadows and grasslands. Um, same with our area, um, removing eucalyptus. Yeah, eucalyptus is uh, non-native, <laughs> right? And uh, it doesn't play well with fire. So um, absolutely, Mel, you, you hit it on the head and uh, you gotta get ready and then stay ready. Keep doing the maintenance treatments. This problem isn't going away. We're not gonna go into a century where it vanishes um, we're going to have to do treat acres and then maintain them. And they're cheaper to maintain once we get them set up. So, um, but that is the key. Yeah, we're finding that we're trying to uh, leverage as much as we can in San Mateo County to um, mitigate our eucalyptus problem. It's extremely expensive, but um, when we do so, you know, we do it once and then it's done forever. So that's kind of, um, that is a goal of ours here in San Mateo County. Absolutely. Okay. Amanda has a question. Uh, she lives in uh, a very rural part of the county and um, in the forest around her house, um, it's, it's predominantly an oak woodland, but it's being uh, changed to uh, Doug firs coming in now. And a lot of Doug firs coming in and her worry is that the canopy of the oak, oaks are getting less light and uh, she's presuming that uh, they're being compromised. So her question is, should something be done to reverse this process? Uh, the, the, the California uh, indigenous tribes we're working with, especially in the north, they're experiencing this in their black oak and tan oak woodlands. And because uh, acorns are a really important part of the diet, they're interested in moving into these uh, oak conditions. And Doug fir is the, is the weed that's seeding in there and, and over vast areas and really rapidly. Which species you go with is a consequence uh, of the values that are at play there. And if you want to maintain oak woodlands, then Douglas fir is a weed that will burn them out. Uh, it's easier to maintain oak woodlands and they're gonna end up being better climate adapted uh, in the 21st century and so uh, dealing with Douglas fir is probably going to be pretty important in these areas. This problem is of significant consequence up and down the entire West Coast. Douglas fir is well adapted under so many conditions and it's invading um, many, many areas during the period of fire exclusion. So what do you value? What do you want to maintain on the landscape? What's more climate adapted? Act in those directions to be able to facilitate those conditions that you can maintain. Uh, the oak woodlands make more sense to me, but it depends on the kinds of values there and the things that are at risk, right? Are there habitat issues, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, most of our foresters here are, um, have the concept of, re of removing the, uh, the dug fir. So I think, I think that's pretty much the consensus here. It's just doing the work is yep. um, where we need to focus. Okay, uh, Jeff has a question um, where the various beetles that are killing off pines and firs, um, how were they kept in check historically by regular fires? Or are the beetles a more recent inhabitant of the conifers? Uh, 
No, the, uh, that's a great question. The Beatles have been around almost as long as they, they've co-evolved with their conifer hosts, going back to, we think, the Devonian uh, epoch. So they've been around for a long time, making a living. What's different is they're in a non-native role, right, after fire exclusion. More trees, more adjacent patches. So, um, so if you stop and think about um, what fires would do in pine forest, frequent fires opened up pine forest conditions. So you didn't have overcrowding. The, the period of fire exclusion allowed trees to regenerate and release. They were shade tolerant typically, and they created crowded conditions. And when you're having the deep droughts that you have, there's not enough water to go around. And the beetles cue, on, cue in on those low vigor conditions for the first attacks. And then populations build and then they can ma mass attack vigorous trees. And that's what happened with the huge die-off event you all experienced in the Southern part of the state. Um, so they're natives in a non-native role. They're responding to more forest area, denser forests, more layering and less water available to the crowded condition. Uh, Nikki has a question um, about uh, thinning our oak. So our oak woodland. So. Um, and our mixed evergreen habitat. So along our roadways, we're trying to focus on clearing the evacuation routes. And when we open up too much canopy, we have invasive broom, thistle, and other weedy invasives um, fill in. So do you have any um, mitigation remedies that could help us with that prescription? We're the, the, the noxious weeds and non-native plant uh, intrusions are a big deal throughout the West and they cannot be underestimated. Um, in these kinds of conditions, we're trying to do uh, the thinning work um, alongside of uh, non-native plant invasion work as well. And the keys there are to try to not increase the area that's invaded. And then for the, invas the areas that are invaded, uh, apply uh, tried and true remedies to be able to knock out those populations. And uh, and sometimes that requires two or three different methods in combination to knock the population down and keep them maintained. It's a really tough problem and it's not getting smaller under climate change. So uh, the kind of work that needs to be done should be predicated on sound knowledge of what your noxious weed or non-native plant concerns are at the same time and you gotta hit them both. Um, Mel has a question about um, the loss of our large grazing animals across uh, the lands as part of the reduction of fuel, um, the fuel loads, the, the ladder fuels, and then the health of the soil and forest. So has any of your research um, conducted any studies on the loss of the grazing animals? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to part out this question because there's a mm -hmm. couple pieces here. So um, there's so much, so much has changed, right? The domestic livestock grazing, cattle and sheep were introduced and they're not uh, native herbivores on that landscape, but they still can be really helpful. And um, in some communities having sheep and goat herders um, uh, grazing these areas, goats are amazing for eating uh, everything from old shoes to, um, you know, Eurasian black raspberries, They're, they'll eat absolutely anything. And so uh, increasingly communities are trying to engage uh, grazing that's, uh, that's well accomplished in some of these areas as part of the fuel reduction effort. Um, uh, cattle and sheep grazing can be a uh, uh, super useful augmentation uh, in controlling the fire situation, if in fact herd management is done in a great way. We've learned an awful lot how to graze intelligently right now. A lot of it is about managing stubble height and imagining uh, moving critters with the green up and not allowing to linger uh, too long. And so essentially having range riders and people who are managing the grazing actively can produce a positive result. So it's a tool in the toolkit if it's managed well. In terms so, of the effects on soils, the biggest effects we're seeing on soils are coming from fires that burn too hot and severe. They're burning out the duff and litter layers, most of the organic residues, and in many places we're back down to parent material and, and soils without much organic residue, and uh, we're having to rebuild. So uh, 
restoring a more characteristic fire regime is a critical key to restoring the effect on soils associated with severity. So um, when we plan our fuel, re fuel reduction projects, um, again, our, our forest and our problem has gotten so big, it's extremely expensive. And so money is always, um, you know, an issue for us. But as we plan these projects and, you know, determine the scope, um, if you had a choice, if we could only do, say, all the, all the underbrush and maybe thin out some very small saplings versus um, just doing some of the thinning of the trees, how, how would you potentially, and this would be in the, this would be in the WUI, how would you potentially uh, prioritize that? It's a really great question. I alert you to a paper done by Jim Agee and again, Carl Skinner from 2005. It's in Forest Ecology and Management. Um, and it talks about basic fire safe principles for the forest and you can apply them incrementally. And the last thing that you would do according to their paper. So when you're, when you're thinning out forests, you're managing fire behavior, things that drive flame length, energy release, fire line intensity and fire rate of spread and the probability of crown fire initiation and spread. And what they basically say is you start on the ground and you deal with the surface fuels and then you move into the fuel ladders that exist. Um, when you've done that, you've, you've broken the connection between the energy release from surface fuels and its ability to transition into the grounds. So essentially they'll walk you through uh, these fire safe principles that allow you to be able to think about. Probably. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> how to sequence the work. So it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great set of ideas to, to uh, apply to your thought process. And uh, if you can afford to do the thinning, Thinning, if you stop and think about it, takes crown fuels and it puts them on the ground. It relocates fuels. So if you're going to do the thinning, the follow-up slash burning is going to be ultra critical. In many condi conditions, if you don't follow up with the slash removal, you actually made it worse. So where you do thin, there's a one-two punch there. Thin it, Remove the commercial pieces if they're there, and then you've got a pile burn and broadcast burn as is appropriate to the conditions. Yeah, I've seen some local projects where they've just cut the material and they've broadcast it instead. In, in These are areas where they could have easily brought in machinery to chip it or even maybe even done some burn piles, but instead they're broadcasting, but there's so much fuel and then to to add the broadcasting, it just seems like it wasn't an appropriate prescription um, for the project. So what you're just saying is cut it and remove it. That's important. It is really important. And remember I told you about um, the effect of fire on fire interactions on the landscape, the power of reburning. The complexity of the forest and the connectivity of dead wood on the ground was driven by this fire on fire interaction. So it's, it's not only ecologically sound, but you want to know, you want to learn for your areas, how much areas should have dead wood for critters that need large dead wood, and, uh, and then how to spatially provide that on the ground so you don't have this high contagion of dead wood patch after patch after patch, right? So there's some problem solving. It's associated with um, what happened in this geography? How did it look? How did it work? What can I replicate? There isn't a one size fits all answer. It, it varies uh, from north to south and from mountain range to mountain range and so forth. So, in some of our projects, again, these are in the uh, in the oak, mostly in the oak woodlands. It's taking us. So we do the work. You know, the majority of the year of the work, year one, year two, and then year three, four, five, we are going back in and um, doing the maintenance on the, you know, the things that come back that are, um, are unwanted. And it seems um, after year three or four, things start to get a lot easier. And so if people could just hang in there, it seems a little bit and maintain their projects for just a, at least a couple of years and then go back and do, you know, some of this, you know, maybe every two years. Um, what, is your, what is your research on that, maintaining projects? Um, 
we're finding out that the maintenance is critical and the maintenance interval depends on the productivity of the environments you're managing, right? If they're really productive, then maintenance burns need to happen every four or five years. If they're much less productive, they become fuel limited and you can wait longer. And so an awful lot of it is uh, observing how fuel conditions change, what's the rate of change, and that determines the application rate of the maintenance treatments. Uh, it'll it'll vary from three to five years on the fast end to as much as 10 years uh, for maintenance treatments that stick the landing, and it varies by veg type and productivity setting. And, uh, and there are very qualified people around the West who can basically help you to to provide that gauge, but the key is maintaining the treatments. That was the omission. Just have them think about it. We're the first generations of humans that stopped burning the West out of Um People were burning until about 1850, these environments. And so this tells you how fast fuels accumulate and why this is a transgenerational commitment. We, we hand off a prepared environment to the next group of folks and they continue that work and that's how we stay safe with fires. Well, I think people are ready for a change and you know we're learning a lot from history of what of what they did, what worked and I think we're we're looking back in time and I I I see in our in San Mateo County how we want to start um, initiating those practices because they worked and we know we're in trouble here. <laughs> And um, we, we, like, you, like you said, we need to pull all the tools in the toolbox need to come out and we need to start working fast and hard. Yeah. So um, Paul, I wanna thank you for a, I mean, extremely enlightening presentation. I, you answered a lot of questions and your research is so important. Um, you know, we'd like to have you back, you know, maybe set up a forum um, with maybe a, a weather researcher and pull it all together. Not that we want to scare anybody, but this is really scary stuff for a lot of us because um, we we live, you know, in the buoy, and so we know we all have skin in the game here. Yeah, you bet. It's uh, one of the reasons why I continue to do the public presentations and stuff is because I'm actually optimistic. I've seen us pull off um, big work in the past in our history, and we just have to get down to business. And I'm already seeing a shift in my own community in the last six, seven years because of the fact that we're incrementally making headway uh, in changing our codes and those kinds of things. Um, so I'm optimistic. I actually think it is a scary time, but it's also a very doable body of work. And we've got to get busy and have a big footprint and uh, continue until, it's like painting a battleship, right? You start at one end, finish on the other end, rinse and repeat. And this is the work ahead of us um, and we can do it. Yeah, I believe we can, and uh, we're just we're just getting started, and uh, we're lucky to have people that like you have been in the business a long time and, and can kind of point us in the right direction. I think that's what that's what we need to be pointed in the right direction. So, all right, well, thanks thank for, you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. You betcha. Okay. See you later. Bye. Bye. All right, well, that was super informative. I think I feel really lucky that we were able to um, get Dr. Hesberg here um, to present. Um, I think he answered a lot of questions and I think we got a lot of good information. And I think we have a great resource if we get stuck on a project um, in writing the scope or the prescription, we, you know, we can maybe ask him and um, I will, um, I'll listen to the recording and all the different articles that he mentioned, I'll try to pull that out, so.